This is Bloomberg. We'll talk more about the markets. We'll talk about uh, what is happening. This is the picture right now, as you can see. We've got a stock 600 that is trading down by 1.6%. Uh, we are seeing certainly a little bit of nervousness, both in terms of what is happening in the stock 600 and futures going into the Fed. Fed tightening is going to be the story of this afternoon. Are we going to see a recession? We've just been talking to Dave about that. That is the big focus as we go into the, uh, the Powell testimony a little bit later on. This is what some of our guests have been talking about on that very subject. A recession is inevitable at some point. It's almost unavoidable. I got to think that the odds are that there's going to be a recession. Seeing a cooling of the economy is something that, that uh, we believe is appropriate. As to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. We're going to have kind of a tough period here. Our economists, as you've noted, this morning have increased their odds of a recession this year, but really more focused into next year. If we can stabilize the energy market, I, I believe when the Fed does their job, we'll, we'll have inflation under control. Inflation's not going to cure itself. There will be, again, more surprises and more shocks coming from uh, central banks. I think this inflation is quite bad. It's, it's intransigent. It's not transitory. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the consequence will be a recession. Meanwhile, the Richmond Fed president, Thomas Markin, says the Fed should raise rates and do so fast, uh, do so as fast as it can, basically, without, though, causing undue harm to markets or the economy. We are in a situation where inflation is high, it's broad-based, it's persistent, and rates are still well below normal. And so I think the spirit is you want to get uh, back to where you want to go as fast as you can uh, without breaking anything. Let's talk more about this. Tatiana Puhan, Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Tobum, joining us now from our London studio. Tatiana, what do you expect to hear? The Fed is going to be uh, on deck a little bit later on. We've got two days of testimony coming up from Fed Chair Jay Powell. What are you expecting to hear from him? Well, I think um, what we should expect to hear from them is just that, that interest rates should go up further. Um, because I think inflation you know, is a problem that is going to persist. Uh, because of, you know, continued um, geopolitical tensions, because of COVID impacts on this industrial production and so on. So this is going to say hi. But on the other hand, the question is also whether the Fed and other central banks will actually be able to raise rates enough to um, keep inflation under control, because we also have these mountains of debt, of public debt, that have been created over the last years. Um, and so it's questionable, you know, whether they will really be able to get inflation under control. What does that mean for markets? How are you thinking about your investment strategy? Well, I think, um, you know, after the Fed tried to make us believe that, um, you know, we have transitory inflation, now they try to make us believe that we will get a soft landing. And, um, well, personally, I don't believe in the soft landing. So I think um, clearly we should get prepared for recession pressure. And that means uh, for markets that, um, you know, we will also get um, market concentration actually uh, reversing. So um, if you want, markets have concentrated now over many years, and this was really driven by um, the consumer economy that was growing and growing and growing. And this concentration has only started to come down. And so this mean reversion has only started. And it means that diversification, from my point of view, is really the most important thing that investors should think about today, because cap-weighted indices, they're hugely concentrated in very particular types of risk. If investors have got money, and a lot of them have right now in cash, how should they be? How should they be thinking about that cash? Is that something they want to hold on to right now? What should they be doing? Well, I think given you know the inflationary pressure that we see, holding cash is also something that you know we give you for sure a loss of eight percent or even more per year. So clearly, that is also not um, the best thing you can do. What we do see is is that um, investors they they start to think again about investments, for instance, into corporate bonds. So we do see that appetite is coming back for this asset class. And then obviously, you know, when we go into risky assets, I mean, you can always think about strategies that use derivatives, you know, to sort of overlay the risky asset exposure. Um, you can also think about other diversifying assets. Um, so we have actually been um, working a lot in, in, in the crypto space, so Bitcoin as an alternative standard of value. Um, so, you know, there, there are different um, strategies that, that investors could deploy. But clearly, um, holding just onto cash is, is also not, um, you know, the only solution. 
Tatiana, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much indeed for your input today. We really appreciate it. Tatiana Puhan, Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Tobum. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, as I said just a moment ago, we're going to continue with our conversations from the Qatar Economic Forum. In just a moment, we're going to be joined by the IAG CEO, Luis Guerrero. He's going to be joining us next to talk about when we get back to flying as normal. We'll talk about that next with Luis. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson at the Qatar Economic Forum. We're in Doha. We're talking to a lot of senior people from the aviation industry. Bloomberg Intelligence says that inflation-beating wage hikes could be needed to smooth out some airline operations over the next one or two years. We've certainly seen some recent disruption, European aviation markets, certainly showing the challenges facing the region's airlines right now. BI analysts say that passing on rising costs to passengers may be tough going forward. Joining me now to try and answer some of those questions is the IAG CEO, Luis Gallego. Nice to see you, Luis. Always nice a pleasure you. to speak with you. Good morning. We are having an incredible summer. Everybody wants to go on holiday. They want to go somewhere, anywhere. This is a post-pandemic boom. Yes. How sustainable is it? Okay, I think, uh, as you say, uh, people want to travel after the pandemic. And what we see is that uh, we are going to have a, a very strong uh, summer. The pent-up uh, demand is there. The premium leisure traffic uh, is uh, in a peak. But, uh, as you say, the, the question is, uh, is this a bubble? Is this going to continue? What we see now is the bookings that we have for the holiday periods uh, at the end of the year. We have uh, the same trends. So we don't see why this is going to change. Uh, COVID, I think, uh, has implied a change in the behavior of the customers. Um, we see that now the people, they want to fly not only for holidays, but also they are ready to work from different places and they are ready to combine uh, business with leisure. So we need to see how all this uh, is going to uh, combine together. So we don't have a demand problem, but we do have a supply problem. Yes. You are short of people. The ground handlers are short of people. There's no baggage handlers. Mm. Uh, air traffic control has issues. When do those issues get resolved? Okay, I think it's a difficult situation that we're living in different regions of the world. For Europe, uh, we have uh, Amsterdam, we have Frankfurt, we have uh, London that uh, they're having a lot of uh, problems. I think in the U.S. they had the problems uh, last year because they, they have a uh, huge uh, domestic uh, market that uh, we don't have. Uh, but there are some places like, uh, for example, Spain, where we don't see the problems. So we don't see the problems because uh, we had a far lower scheme that uh, we could use to, to adjust the, the size of uh, the labor force to, to, the, to the capacity we were flying. In the case of uh, UK, I think the situation is worse than other places. The main reasons, uh, first of all, is that uh, we had a lot of changes, changes in the policy about the traffic light system, etc. Uh, I think now the labor market uh, is reduced, so it's difficult to, to, to hire people, people to work on the ground, as uh, you are saying. Uh, but uh, I think we are adjusting the capacity in order uh, to give resilience to the operation to, during the summer. And our idea is that uh, to reach the end of the year with an uh, operation that uh, can be comparable to the rest of airlines that we have in the group. So by the end of the year, you think yes. you're going to have it under control again? Yes. Um, in terms of what you think the summer is going to look like, though, more specifically, we are in the midst of a train strike, mm -hmm. rail strike here in the UK. There is talk that that could broaden out. Do you think that could end up affecting you? I think uh, we are going to see strikes during the summer because uh, everybody has uh, suffered a lot during this crisis. Uh, so in our case, for example, all the employees, uh, they have uh, reductions in salary. Uh, they work a lot uh, to be where we are right now. In some cases, like in British Airways, uh, we needed to let uh, 10,000 people uh, to leave uh, the company. Yep. Uh, so it has been very tough. And now we are in a situation where after COVID, we have a high inflation. 
and the people uh, they want to see what happens uh, in the future. So it's a difficult time because we need to talk to them, but in some way we need to link the recovery of the company with the recovery of all of our, our people. And that's the challenge that we have in front of us, but I think it's going to be in general, not only in aviation, a tough summer with uh, possible strikes. You talk about the inflation rate that we're seeing. One of the areas we're certainly seeing an inflation rate that is very high is in fuel. Jet fuel has basically doubled in price. Does that mean the fares are going to stay high? Do you expect these fuel prices to remain for quite some time? I saw of Scott Kirby at United. These kinds of prices are now his base case. Does that mean fuel is going to translate into higher, higher fares for quite some time? Okay, I think uh, our projections for next year is that the fuel price is going to be a little lower, but uh, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen. What is true is that we have a hedge uh, position. Uh, this year we have uh, above 70% of the fuel hedge. Next year we only have uh, 25%. Uh, the most important thing is uh, your competitors, how they are. You have people that they hedge, you have people that uh, they, they don't have uh, any hedging. So I think uh, if at the end we arrive to a situation with high fuel price and no hedging, for sure, we will transfer uh, the cost to the, to the price, uh, to, to the fare. And you think the customer will take that? Uh, I think uh, we had periods in the past with high fuel price that uh, we had uh, very good profitability for the airlines. So at the end is how you can compete with the others. And what we see now is that the people, they are ready to pay more to fly after the COVID. One of the uh, implications of this high jet fuel price could be a change in tack when it comes to sustainable aviation fuel. The, the spread between the two has narrowed considerably as a result of the, the higher jet fuel prices that we're seeing right now. How does that affect your path, your thinking, towards turning your airlines into more sustainable operators? Does it accelerate it? Does it slow it down? I'm wondering how you're thinking about this high jet fuel price and what it means for SAF. Uh, we, uh, in International Airlines Group, uh, we were the first group uh, of airlines worldwide to commit to net zero emissions in 2050. And we define a roadmap to arrive there. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be a comb combination of new technologies, uh, new aircraft, possible hydrogen uh, aircraft, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, carbon offset, uh, carbon capture, uh, improvement in operations. So we have a, a, a lot of things that uh, we are doing to, to reach that objective. Uh, we talk about uh, sustainable aviation fuel. We have an objective to power 10% of our, of our yeah. flights with sustainable aviation fuel in 2030. And what we are doing right now is to invest uh, in uh, different companies in order to have this 10% that we need. And we are buying sustainable aviation fuel uh, right now. Uh, the problem we have is that uh, there is not enough sustainable aviation fuel. Yep. So we need to have um, the So if more was available, you would buy more? Yeah, yes, we will buy uh, more because uh, I think we are going to have a shortage in the future. Uh, Unless the government, they decide uh, to invest uh, in new plants of sustainable aviation fuel. For example, to, to achieve the objective of 10% uh, that we have for sustainable aviation fuel in 2030, we need around 30 plants in Europe uh, to produce the, yeah. that. So we need the right policies to invest in sustainable aviation fuel. Otherwise, it's not going to be a question and, and, of and airlines. We don't have the right policies now. At the moment, a lot of the feedstock that could go to SAF yes. goes to sustainable diesel. How yes. do we fix that? I think uh, what we need to do is uh, something more similar to, to what they are doing in the States, that uh, they are putting incentives uh, to build plants of sustainable aviation fuel. I think in our case, uh, now we are in the middle of the packages like the Fit for 55 uh, in Europe. And I think uh, what we see is uh, that we talk more about taxes, and I think that's not the solution. The solution is to have the capacity to invest uh, in technology, to invest in, in new plants in order to produce the sustainable aviation fuel. As you say, you've been leading in this, in this process. Yes. Uh, great to see you doing that. Luis, thank you very much indeed. We really appreciate your time thank joining you. us here at the Casa Economic Forum. Luis Gallego, thank the you. CEO of IAG. What have we got coming up for you? Paramount Plus launches today with content including the Michelin Impossible franchises and Star Trek. We are going to speak to the company's CFO, Nevin Chopra, a bit later in this program. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Let's get an update on what you need to know. Here with the first word news, Alice Atkins. Hi, Guy. Germany is said to be preparing to trigger the second level of its three-stage emergency gas plan. In a move that may mean higher prices for industry and households, the government could move from the early warning stage to the alarm stage. Europe's biggest economy is seeking to reduce gas use after Russia slashed deliveries through a key pipeline last week. Bloomberg understands President Biden will today call on Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday as he looks to cool soaring pump prices heading into summer. Biden said earlier this week he was studying whether to back suspension of the 18.4 cents per gallon tax. Average US pump prices are currently hovering around $5 a gallon. The largest party in Mario Draghi's Italian coalition has split after Foreign Minister Luigi Di Maio quit over the party's refusal to back military support for Ukraine. Di Maio says he's leaving the five-star movement, which he used to lead, and will start a new parliamentary group. Current five-star leader Giuseppe Conte opposes the government's policy of sending weapons to Ukraine. Global news, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Guy? Alice, thank you very much indeed. We're all waiting for the Fed. The Fed chair is going to be speaking on Capitol Hill a little bit later on. What kind of a message are we going to be getting? Stock market's dipping a little bit. The recession fears are definitely there. Take a look at what is happening with the stock 600 right now, and you'll see that very clearly. We're down by 1.74%. S&P futures are down by 1.8, so we're looking like if we're going to have a fairly negative open, but I think it's going to be a reasonably bumpy day. The dollar is bid going into that testimony. Pay attention to that, uh, and you are seeing the U.S. 10-year yield. We're, we're catching a little bit of a bid, so yield's coming down a touch, but look where we are still, 323. We've been higher than that. Does the trajectory change as a result of what we get today from Fed Chair Jay Powell? Coming up, there's a new streaming service vying for your attention if you are in the UK. Paramount Plus launches today with content including Mission Impossible and Star Trek. We're going to speak to the company's CFO, Navin Chopra, is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. As fast as possible, Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin says rates should be raised rapidly as Jay Powell prepares to testify in the Senate. Stocks tanking in the first hour of European trading. Futures don't look too clever stateside either. Oil follows equities crude dropping with economic concerns certainly in focus. President Biden gearing up for showdown talks with industry executives later today. And UK inflation hitting a new 40-year high, 9.1%. Food and energy prices are surging. The pound slips against most of the major currencies out there. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson. We're live at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Let's turn our attention, though, to what is happening in the entertainment industry. I want to return to Danny Berger in London. Paramount's opening up a new frontier in the streaming wars. Let's find out what's going, Let's find out what's going on. Danny, over to you. Yeah, Guy, just at the scene, you know, Netflix, it's been streaming in the UK for about a decade. Disney Plus, they launched at the onset of the pandemic. Apple TV Plus debuting in 2019. And now there's a new streamer on the block. As you were saying, Paramount Plus launches in the UK today with over 8,000 hours of content, including Star Trek, Mission Impossible franchises, and the smash hit Yellowstone, which I should say, the burgers my parents absolutely adore. Joining us now is Naveen Chopra, the CFO of Paramount. So, Naveen, first, thanks for joining. So, thanks, why man. is 2022, why is that the year for Paramount Plus here? Well, we're just incredibly excited uh, to be launching Paramount Plus here in the UK. The UK has been a very important market for the company for many years. Uh, we've been a big uh, uh, content creator and content distributor here, both by way of our free-to-air channels as well as our pay television networks and now uh, we're extending that with the launch of Paramount Plus here which as you pointed out is going to bring uh, 8,000 hours mm. of content to the market including big global tent poles like in 1883 like Halo 
but also a really compelling selection of local content uh, designed for the UK market. Uh, over 20 original programs coming here. But, but to be fair, I mean, your competitors are already here. So is the pie getting bigger or are you taking market share? Uh, you know, we see Paramount Plus as being very additive to uh, options that consumers already have, but also very distinct. We bring to the table a much broader offering with content for everyone. It's not just about high-end scripted dramatic entertainment. It's about the full spectrum of kids programming, of unscripted and reality programming, of uh, news, live events. And in many markets, we actually even have uh, sports as part of that equation. Mm. And of course, movies from Paramount Pictures. Um, so it's a very distinctive, broad content offering. And it's also at a very compelling price point, which in today's market environment we think is, is a great asset. Well, let's get into that because it, it does feel like this precarious time to ask consumers to add on more, to pay more. If you have a cost of living crisis here, folks are back outside. They're not indoors constantly streaming. Streaming hasn't really been tested historically in this type of downturn. How do you combat those market forces? Well, you know, historically, home entertainment has actually been very resilient in times of economic uncertainty. Uh, and the reason for that is that television viewing and even uh, movie going provide tremendous value relative to other forms of leisure and entertainment. But, but is it fair to say streaming, it hasn't really been tested in the same way? I mean, it's a different form of the historical corollaries. Because... Perhaps, but if you think about it, the value that you get out of streaming for, in the UK, seven pounds a month, be able to watch incredible, high-quality content anytime, anywhere you like. It's very compelling relative to other things that consumers may need to spend money on. And so we're actually quite bullish about um, streaming adding to the resilience of the broader uh, home entertainment. Okay, business. talk to me about how bullish. You got, what, 40 million subscribers as of the first quarter. How much do you think UK is going to add to that? Well, we haven't uh, announced any specifics around the UK, but we uh, are on a path to achieve over 100 million subscribers on a global basis by the end of 2024. Uh, we have 40 million Paramount Plus subscribers at the end of Q1, as you mentioned, over 60 million subscribers across the full portfolio of our D2C services. Uh, so we're very bullish. Uh, the UK is going to be a big part of that. Um, and it all is driven by our content portfolio, which we think is second to none. How expensive is it? to acquire customers in the UK, given that you do have to launch at a competitive price point? Is there some element of loss leading in the UK, at least for the time being? Well, we think it's all about having a very smart and efficient approach to acquiring customers. And for us, that means not being entirely dependent on the direct-to-consumer model, which is something that was very much in vogue uh, a couple of years ago. We have taken a, a broader approach to distribution. Direct consumer is one part, but we've also embraced partners. Uh, we have a, a very exciting partnership with Sky uh, coming into the UK, where Paramount Plus will be bundled with the Sky Cinema tier. That's an incredibly efficient way of acquiring millions of subscribers that um, uh, have lower churn than the D2C model. We also continue to embrace the channel store models with uh, partners like um, Amazon and Roku and mm. Apple. So, um, Which, of course, Amazon, you have history at as well, so you know that market well. Uh, I do have to ask, though, beyond just partnering, are acquisitions in this market interesting? The UK government preparing a sale of Channel 4. Any interest there? Well, we've, uh, we're big fans of the UK market. We're big fans of uh, the broadcast model here. We've um, had tremendous success with Channel 5 since we acquired that uh, a few years ago. We've been able to grow share. We've been able to uh, create, I think, some very compelling content. Um, nothing that we think we need to do. We mm. like the portfolio of assets that we have in, in the marketplace. Um, but Not we need to do, but want to do, perhaps? Well, we always look at interesting ideas. Um, it's, I think, early in the process with Channel 4 to really know um, whether that's going to be of interest. But, uh, you know, we're big fans of this market, and we love the, uh, the hand that we have here today. You know, it's interesting. You, you talk about sort of the range of types of shows you have. Do you think you need this idea of, of one standout show to draw people in? Less than a minute here. And if so, tell me, what, what show is it going to be? <laughs> well, uh, as I said, we like uh, having a broad content portfolio, but we have definitely seen some of our shows create incredible excitement in other markets. Uh, Halo is huge on a global basis. 1883 has just been a huge hit for us in the U.S., we're looking forward to bringing all of those to uh, uh, the U.K. market. Mm. 
plus big movies from uh, Paramount Pictures and, of course, great local UK content. Yeah, I heard there's a, a recent big movie out there. Maybe it uh, starts with a top and ends with a gun. So uh, certainly and, and has generated over $900 million in box office revenue. So we're, uh, that will there come to Paramount Plus eventually, and uh, it's an incredible movie. And we didn't even talk about Sil Sylvester Stallone. I mean, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thanks so much. Guy, that's the CFO of Paramount, Naveen, Naveen Chopra. I haven't seen it yet. I'm really excited to see it. My whole family's excited to see it. We're going to be seeing it soon. Let's put it that way. When I get home, that is definitely top of the list. Danny, great stuff. Really interesting interview. Thank you very much indeed. Paramount launching in the UK. Up next, we're going to talk about travel a little bit more. Uh, the Accor Chair and CEO Sebastian Bazan is going to be joining us here at the Qatar Economic Forum. That interview next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Um, this morning's UK CPI number only just underscores the cost of living crisis that many families are facing. It's hurting demand for some things. Is it going to hurt demand for travel, though? At the moment, we are seeing a huge boom in travel at the moment. How long does that last for? Well, let's try and get an answer to that question. Sebastian Baza uh, is the CEO of Accor, Europe's largest hotel company. There are many questions that, that I can ask you at the moment. Yeah. But let's start off with the big one. We're, we're all out. We want to go somewhere, anywhere, as a result of being locked up for the pandemic. How long does this, how long does this boom in travel last for? Well, let's start with I've been waiting for that moment for the last two and a half years. Yeah. We went through hell for the last two and a half years. So finally, I have a tailwind. So it's going to last as long as it could. I, my bill production, certainly for an extra 12 months. Uh, so until summer next year, because people okay. want to, people have money on the saving account. They want to get re-control of their life. They want to have a better life. And they want basically to have fun with friends and siblings. So for the summer, incredible. Until Christmas season, probably very strong. Then, if you hit a recession, inflation, and whatever we know is coming, how impactful that's going to be to the tourism industry? I don't know. I believe probably not as much in the past recessions because okay. something has changed post-pandemic. Now 60% of the travelers are, happen to be leisure and domestic, less than two or three hours from your home by car or by train. So that's an easier travel, less cumbersome, less expensive, and a different type of travel. So when you have a big recession, what's being impacted first is international travelers. Yep. And we're going to be less and less depending on international travel. You sound pretty convinced that we're going to get a recession, though. Well, I've, you know, it's going to be a self-prophecy. <laughs> self the people here we talk about it. Yeah. I'm not sure there is. If we get our minds together, all the European Union's G7, G20, it might not occur as bad as people think. But one of, the, one of the reasons we might get a recession is because the supply side of the economy continues to struggle. Everybody in leisure is experiencing the staff shortages that, that, that are showing up at airports, at hotels, in restaurants, you name it, everybody seems to have the same sort of problem. How long is it going to take to fix that problem? Um, I'd, better, I'd better find a solution very soon. We okay. miss, we're missing 10 or 15% of the staff we had before. France alone, we're missing 360,000 people in hotels, bars, restaurants. That's not Accor alone. Accor alone, I'm missing 4,000 people. So that means probably three or four million people missing in hospitality in the world. Um, and it's they're not missing because of underpay. That's not the main reason. Okay. The main reason, which is tough to fix, people have left the industry because they wanted to be away from sacrificing weekends, nights, and they want to find a job when they can work remotely. So how do you On, solve that? If, well, if that's... it's <laughs> difficult because when you work in a hotel, you're not going to be working remotely, my dear. You'd better actually be there at the reception <laughs> or at the kitchen. So it's a, probably the solution which I've been working on there, which is a tough one. People, you're going to have to accept to have people working for our industry only two or three days a week. And then so on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, they're going to work for Accor. On Wednesday, Thursday, they're going to work for a tech company. And then they could be self-employed on the remaining two days. So I need to readapt in terms of labor legislation, in terms of human resources, in terms of training. I'm going to be training people only for two days. But people will accept those sacrifices if it's only for two or three days. It's a total revolution on the way you interact with people. Okay, but doable, that, absolutely doable. 
that is doable, but it's, as you say, going to take a while to shift the regulation and the mindset, both of governments and well, industry. Flexibility is the key word for You talk to everybody uh, today between 17 years old and 30 years old, don't even tell them you're going to be working for me for 20 years. They simply do not want to work 20 years yeah. in the same company. They want to be able to basically choose and have flexibility and sense of purpose. We have the purpose, we can give them flexibility, and I need them, so I'm actually going to be on my knees trying to charm them. I need to be, because sure, my I'm, hotel is going to be booked, yeah. and I need those clients to be serviced. I have no doubt that you'll be capable of charming them. Um, there are a lot of hotels coming online at yeah. the moment, um, particularly at the high end of the market. Are we going to end up going from a situation where we have not enough to too many? Probably not. What people are severely mistaken about the hotel industry, for the last 40 years I heard that, for the last 10 years I've been chairman of our core. But if you look at the numbers of hotels in the world, the, number, the increase of supply is between 1% and 2% per annum. The increase in demand has been between 25 and 4% per annum. So this is the only industry of any size where you have a demand which is exceeding supply for the last 40 years, probably remaining for the next 10 years. What happened though, you have a lot of hotels non-performing because they lost their identity, because it hasn't been refurnished. Those hotels still exist, but they no longer perform. So yeah. a new hotel with a new design, new concept, new identity, will take the place of an existing one, that guy's going to die, or it's going to, be, it's going to be disappearing. So, no, don't be too much worried about our supply, because the facts actually tell you the opposite. Talking of new hotels, yeah. you've got, what, two opening here, about to we open here before the World Cup? Six opening here before the World Cup. You've got in six addition, opening here. In addition to 12 existing. The, the they question... better be ready on time. I promise. Okay. <laughs> I promise that is here. They have to be open by the You're, you're confident. The World Cup was four months ago, away, and, yeah. and I'm, seeing, I'm still seeing a lot of building work happening here. You're confident that you're going to be ready? Uh, yes, I, I told you it's a must. I mean, I, we happen to be the largest hotel operator in Doha, in Qatar. No, they will be ready. They will be just ready, but they will be ready. Uh, so okay. you're going to have, yeah, you'll be, you'll be having reception, food and beverage. You may not have all the rooms ready, but you will never notice it. Okay. Uh, so, but they will, be, they will be fine. It's going to be a great World Cup. I guarantee you this. I'm very close to this country for the last 32 years. That country will shine during the World Cup. I'm looking forward to the football as well. Really quite excited about that. Um, final question. We've just seen a French National Assembly election that has produced a divided parliament. Yeah, that's an understatement. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to... I'm, <laughs> <laughs> it's a I'm, mess. I'm trying to, OK, it's a mess. The, the president's going to struggle. What does that mean for the way that you're thinking about how you're going to interact with the government going forward? What does it mean for France? Well, it means for France that I guess we'd better have somebody fixing an agenda, be a better listener, and embarking those who actually have the same idea what... We need reforms, we need a firm hand, we need a leader. And we need people to think collectively as opposed to only looking at their own turf. I think they have he has enough resources between the Republican Party, between his party, on his own. I think he's going to make it happen. But it's true that I guess you're going to have a lot of people being unhappy about it, but he has, there's no other option. Somebody has to lead, somebody has to decide, and somebody has to know he will not be well loved in this country. That's okay. This means somebody. to be he means <laughs> to be a leader. Otherwise, don't do that job. You know that a lot of people are not going to like you. That's yeah. okay. So, uh, and he has, he has the bones. He can do it. He can do it. Yeah. He has that skill set within him to be able to make uh, that happen. Yeah, he probably did not wish for what's happening now, but it's been happening. So it's, uh, now he has to, again, listen better. Sebastian, great to catch up with yeah, you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very here. much indeed for your time this morning. Thanks we really life. appreciate it. Sebastian Bazin, the CEO of Accor. Uh, okay, let's catch up with what we need to know here with a business flash, Leanne Gerrits. Shares in Germany's buyer tumbled after the U.S. Supreme Court rejected a multi-million dollar appeal from the company that it should be shielded from legal claims that its Roundup weed killer caused cancer. The justices left intact a 25 million dollar award to a Californian man who said decades of exposure to Roundup caused his lymphoma. Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin says the Fed should raise rates as fast as it can without causing undue harm to markets or the economy. Barkin does not vote on monetary policy this year, but says he supported the central bank's 75 basis point hike earlier this month. He says the US central bank may need to raise rates beyond neutral and into restrictive territory. We are in a situation where inflation is high, it's broad-based, it's persistent, and rates are still well below normal. And so I think the spirit is you want to get uh, back to where you want to go as fast as you can uh, without breaking anything.
Volvo's Chinese owner is going public via a blank check merger with special purpose acquisition company Gores Guggenheim. The SPAC says it expects to close the deal on Thursday while the Polestar stock to start trading Friday under the symbol PSNY. The transaction should raise at least $850 million to help fund future models. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Guy? Alice, my apologies. Sorry about that. Thank you very much indeed. Alice Atkins with the, uh, the Business Flash. Quick look at where we are with markets. As I've already indicated, we're waiting for Powell later. That is the narrative that is really going to define the day, probably the rest of the week. He speaks today. He speaks tomorrow as well. He's starting a little bit earlier than normal, actually, 9.30 Eastern. Be interesting to see whether he actually starts on time today. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing in the markets right now, you have got equity markets giving back some ground. Stock 600 down by nearly 2%, trading just north of that 400 mark. Keep an eye on that level for the for the futures stateside 36.99 we're down by 1.82 percent so we're soft going into pal the dollar is bid brent though take a look at what is happening with brent brent's on off we're trading 110.40 right now we're down by nearly four percent so you're going to see a ripple across into some of the energy uh, stocks throughout the day they've been some of the big winners throughout most of this year we're starting to see some real volatility creeping into that segment of the market, though, which is maybe going to shake some investors loose. We'll see what happens there. We're going to talk about what is happening with energy a little bit more coming up next. Germany starting to instigate emergency measures. It's trying to shore up its energy supplies as Russia targets Europe's largest economy by slashing gas supplies. We're going to have more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. So this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Let's talk about what is happening with energy prices. Germany is said to be preparing to trigger second levels of its three-stage emergency plan. This, of course, comes as Russia slashes gas deliveries through key pipelines into Europe's largest economy. Big news on that front last week. We're joined now by Bloomberg's Middle East Energy Markets reporter, Anthony De Paola, to give us a take on what is happening here. Anthony, talk us through the impacts of this new German plan. What does phase two actually look like? Good, good morning, Guy. Uh, yeah, uh, the issue really is that uh, Europe is, 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 doesn't have a solution for a full shutdown of Russian gas supplies into Europe at the moment. They're so dependent on the, the Russian gas supplies for everything from uh, energy, power plants, chemicals, fertilizers. Uh, that there's no real replacement in the immediate term for this. So we're looking at longer-term solutions. Uh, Germany's already gone ahead and uh, uh, re recently contracted some U.S. natural gas. They've been in this region in the Middle East talking about getting some natural gas from uh, the UAE, from Qatar, uh, from other countries here. Those are longer-term uh, supply issues, though. Uh, what's really at stake right now is kind of kicking the can down the road uh, into more the winter months because in this period, what's really important for Europe is that they're able to get that gas and fill up their storage facilities, which would allow them to have excess gas to use in the winter when it gets cold when they really need it. What's happening now, as you said, with those uh, reduced uh, flows from Russia, uh, the European countries are not able to fulfill yep. Uh, those those storage tanks and that's going to be a problem as we get into the winter months uh, so we're going to see that uh, further down the road as well guy why is Brent down today yeah there's so much going on in the uh, oil markets right now guy uh, with, with with many different factors uh, we're looking at a tight supply that's keeping the prices where we are elevated over 100 but those uh, concerns about the recession uh, about continued lockdowns in China um, the potential that that this recession will hurt demand going forward that's that's a, a concern for the oil markets uh, also with the dollar high as it is that's hurting consumer power in some of those consuming countries and again that's compounding uh, those issues yep. of the high oil prices and potential demand destruction in those countries, Guy. Okay. Anthony, great stuff. Thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. Anthony DiPaolo on what's happening in the energy space right now. That just about wraps things up for me. Uh, coming up 
early edition continues. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lines in New York, Anna Edwards, of course, over in London. That's all coming up for you. We're counting you down to pal. This is Bloomberg. We are uh, expecting the economy to contract uh, this quarter. So we are certainly not in denial. I think in hindsight, we spent too much money and too much fiscal response. You want to get uh, back to where you want to go as fast as you can uh, without breaking anything. We need more money to plan for the second pandemic. There's going to be another pandemic. We have to think ahead. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, June 22nd. Our top stories today. Fear of a recession is shaking markets again today. U.S. futures and European equities are down. So are oil prices and other commodities. President Biden tries to ease the pain at the pump. Bloomberg's learned he'll ask Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday. And optimism is evaporating that there can be a soft landing for the U.S. economy. Investors are waiting to hear Fed Chair Jerome Powell's Senate testimony on fighting inflation. Meanwhile, Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin says the central bank should raise rates as fast as it can. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And Kayleigh, yesterday we saw risk appetite return. Today looks very different. Today, concerns about the global economy sticking to commodities and sticking to uh, global stocks. Absolutely. The rebound of yesterday looking very short-lived, Anna, as you saw stocks falling really across the world. A sell-off that started in Asia. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole down about 1.7 percent, but the declines really were most severe for big Chinese technology stocks. As a result, the Hang Seng Tech Index down more than 4% overnight. As Anna alluded to, the concern really is around tightening monetary policy and the implications for growth globally. Of course, because of that global growth concern, that translates into concern around commodities demand, and particularly for iron ore, the concern is China. You actually have seen iron ore prices fall 24% in just the last two weeks. It was down about 6% uh, for those futures in Singapore overnight. At the same time, you are seeing a bid coming into haven assets like global bonds. In Australia, the two-year yield was down 14 and a half basis points overnight after a more than 12 uh, basis point decline yesterday. Right now, it's sitting just around that 3% level. And finally, I would note that the yen is actually the lone Asian currency stronger against the U.S. dollar today. So coming off the weakest level since 1998, right now trading at 136.30 uh, to the dollar. So still quite weak, but a bit of a haven bid for that asset in particular. Of course, the dollar, the big winner on the day more broadly, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, take a look at what's going on in terms of futures after the big gain, the big bounce that we saw yesterday. We're now down again, another 1.6%. The consensus seems to be growing on Wall Street that there will be a recession. The question is whether that takes us down to merely 3,300 or uh, all the way down to 2,900 on the S&P right now. There are very few bulls left out there. Also, the president just saying there's going to be another pandemic, which is terrifying. Um, the 10-year yield down uh, a couple of basis points right now. We're looking at 322 as investors buy that debt, looking for the perceived safety uh, of government debt. And then NYMEX crude also falling hard on recession concerns, down almost 5% right now to 104.46 a barrel for Texas Intermediate. Of course, Bitcoin um, is... Uh, uh, um, correlated to these risk assets and it falls with uh, futures but it's still above 20,000 right now so 20,302 not as bad as we saw on Saturday when it fell below 18,000. Anna what do you see in terms of European markets? Here in Europe then Matt we see pretty broad based selling across European stocks we're down today across the European equity market space down by more than two percent on the Zetra DAX so although a lot of this has to do with fears about global recession and that is sticking to commodities it's not necessarily uh, sticking to the London market more than others so the FTSE 100 is down but down by 1.2 percent the DAX down by 2.1 the CAC down by 1.7 most sectors are in negative territory and energy stocks are the worst performing basic resource stocks also not doing well but we also have some big 
big movers in the more cyclical space as well, and that's weighing on the German market. So here's the energy uh, stock market today. The energy stocks down by 3.4% in response to this. And Matt was talking there about WTI. This is the Brent price now with a 109 handle down by just under, uh, by just over 4%. And whereas we'd seen metals already falling uh, because of some of the issues that Kaylee was talking about and concern around Chinese growth, now it seems the time, uh, in, at least in the last few days, it seems the time for oil markets to play into that theme, that recession fear theme as well. We've had UK inflation data out today, another 40-year high. It edged up from 9% to 9.1%. That was exactly as had been anticipated. So although there's no getting away from the fact that this is a multi-decade high and it is a really high number for inflation here in the UK, it, it was in line with estimates. And so as a result, some in the market dialing back their expectations for what we might see the Bank of England do in terms of the, uh, the, the heavy uh, roster of rate hikes that had been priced into markets previously. And so that weighing on the pound a little bit and also uh, we're seeing a little bit of a retreat in two-year yields and generally money going into, uh, of course, money going into sovereigns as we see stocks selling off. NatWest Group, now this is a throwback to the post-financial crisis. At the time of the financial crisis, November 2008 specifically, we saw the UK government become the biggest shareholder in, uh, in RBA and then part of that is NatWest uh, and they still are the biggest shareholder in NatWest. They've given themselves a little bit of extra time though, Kaylee, to sell down that stake and uh, that stock on the move this morning. All right. Well, one stock moving higher, Anna, but a lot of them are moving down today on concern around growth, of course. And I'm sure that is something that Jerome Powell is going to have to address later on today because the Fed chairman will be on Capitol Hill giving his semi-annual U.S. Senate testimony at 9.30 a.m. New York time. So that's one item on today's agenda. Plus, the Fed speak will continue with Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin speaking again after yesterday saying that the Fed should move fast but hopefully not break anything. We'll also hear from Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans and Phil Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker all will be speaking. And finally, on the economic data front, we'll be getting some U.S. data, including MBA mortgage applications. How are those data points changing in response to higher mortgage rates, Matt? Yeah, absolutely fascinating to watch that as we're focused on housing. Um, Citigroup economists see the chance of a global, global recession now nearing 50 percent. That's the central bank's tighten monetary policy and demand for goods weakens. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny? Matt, yeah, it feels like everyone has a recession call, whether it's 50 or 30 percent of how likely it's to be. You laid, laid out City's argument there. Really, it is one that in order to get a soft landing, there needs to be a perfect storm of supply issues easing and at the same time demand sticking around. A lot of folks don't see that happening. So again, it adds to this building choir we've got. Edgar Denny Kaylee, I know you're speaking to him yesterday, and he told you guys that 45 percent odds of what he sees of a recession in 18 months talked about Goldman yesterday. 30% is where they have it in the next year. And Nomura earlier this week said it was likely in the fourth quarter of this year. Now, the issue, though, is even if the Fed gets inflation under control, Ray Dalio says don't be naive. That's not an all clear for the economy. He wrote about this in a LinkedIn post saying that while tightening reduces inflation, it doesn't make things better. And that's because it takes buying power away. It just shifts some of the squeeze from people via inflation to giving them less buying power. So again, he's saying it's not just about the Fed bringing down inflation, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. For those focused on inflation and concerns about how high it, it, it has got to, uh, of course, oil is part of that, uh, that narrative, Danny. And we do see a little bit of respite today on the oil front. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of respite if you look at it perhaps on a three-day basis. Uh, since Friday, down more than 10%. These are some pretty substantial losses in oil. Yes, there's a bit going on at the White House. Anne Maria, of course, can cover that much better than I can. Um, but, you, but really, this is part of the sell-off today in terms of fear over demand. But one really important thing to note as we look at oil continuing to slide is that there's still a supply issue. This is still a market in backwardation. The fundamentals are still pointing to higher oil. As Goldman says, the Fed, them crimping inflation, um, that's just a symptom that they're bringing down. It doesn't solve the actual problem, which is underinvestment in the oil patch. All right, Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. And Danny alluded to what's happening in Washington, so let's go there next. Bloomberg has learned that President Biden will call on Congress to enact a gasoline tax, tax holiday as average gas prices in the U.S. are around $5 a gallon. The president is set to make a statement at 2 p.m. Eastern time today. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins us now from D.C. for more. So, Anne-Marie, the president's going to ask for it. Will Congress deliver? It's going to be very difficult. Already you have, for over the past months, remember this was floated in February of this year. So for months you've had 
Democratic leaders really pouring cold water on it. In recent months, Speaker Pelosi had said the pros of this are very show businessy, and many are questioning whether or not that relief will even be passed on to consumers. So the president is going to make this pitch today. The administration clearly wants to be seen that they are doing something, especially as these are critical months. And we just got the fact sheet about some of the some of the messaging the president is going to say, and it's going to be through the through September. So these are the critical summer months, and they clearly want to do something. Thing around the 4th of July Independence holiday in the United States when you have gasoline prices just under $5 per gallon. Potentially getting rid of this federal tax of 18 cents could help. But the issue is the president is just calling for it. Congress has to act. They have to get every. They have to get some Republicans on board, which that does not seem likely given some past rhetoric we've already heard in the recent months. And then also his own party. Anne-Marie, we have uh, separately, we're waiting for the Supreme Court to issue a ruling on concealed carry in New York State, and we're watching the Senate um, as they get ready to advance their own gun safety bill. Well, it was advanced last night, and, and these procedures now set up a vote before the Congress leaves for July 4th recess that they're going to have two weeks off, we could potentially see this bipartisan tax become law. And what this would do is it's enhancement of background checks, more money for schools, more money for bolstering mental health resources. And you've had 10 Republicans sign on to this framework yesterday. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell gave his green light for this. So what you potentially will see by the end of this week is what backers of this kind of legislation are saying has not been able to happen for decades is an advancement and enhancement of U.S. gun legislation. But of course, this comes after last month, the massacres we saw, the deadly, devastating massacres in Uvalde, Texas and Buffalo, New York. Amory, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Amory Hordern with a roundup there from Washington. Back here to the UK, inflation rose to a fresh four-decade high in the UK in May. That's after broad increases in the cost of everything from fuel and electricity to food and beverages. Let's get more now with Bloomberg's Laura Wright. And Laura, uh, this is not necessarily seen as the peak for inflation here in the UK. Anna, I just don't know what we are going to do if this isn't the peak. Headline inflation in line with forecast 9.1%. The core slightly below estimates. Interestingly, the proportion of the basket that experienced inflation of more than half a percent month over month fell from 60 percent to 50 percent. That is still bonkers, according to one strategist who I spoke to, but at least the situation isn't getting worse and perhaps it's a sign that tightening expectations have been overcooked. As a result, the market is now projecting a Bank of England year-end base rate of below three percent from where it peaked on Monday. I have a chart for our radio listeners that illustrates just how incomes in the UK are being squeezed. Re real wages for the month of April down 3.5% year over year, excluding bonuses. To put that in context, it's the worst reading since the ONS first started collecting this data all the way back in 2001. It's why we are seeing strike action in the UK this week. Trains on strike for three days of this week. More public sector action on the cards in the coming month. Families struggling to make ends meet. Quick note on the pound UK markets down around half a percent against the greenback due to the lack of surprises in the UK CPI report and the pronounced risk off mood in markets. Yeah, risk off mood indeed. Bloomberg's Laura Wright, thank you so much. Now, speaking of the markets, let's get back to the equity markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre market trading here in the U.S. No surprise, given the declines we are seeing broadly in the commodity complex, you're seeing a lot of commodity tied stocks way down as well. That includes energy players, the likes of ConocoPhillips down 7.3%. Marathon Oil is down about 5%, and it's translating to some of the metals and mining stocks as well. The likes of Freeport McMoran also among the big underperformers in early hours. That stock. Uh, is down around 4% as well. And of course, Matt and I were on Bloomberg Crypto yesterday talking about whether or not we may have seen a bottom in crypto prices, that the rebound was actually going to be sustainable. That rebound today proving very short-lived. Matt was talking about uh, uh, Bitcoin prices earlier, how they are declining, and as a result, crypto-related equities also are moving lower in tandem with that, giving back a large chunk of yesterday's gains. That includes crypto exchange Coinbase, which is down about 4.9% before the bell, Anna.
Kaylee, coming up on the programme, Patrick Spencer joins us, Managing Director at Robert W. Baird & Co. What does he make of recession risk? What does that mean for stocks? And is there still space to hide out in commodities, given the weakness we're seeing in today's trade? And its latest threat to the global economy, the unravelling of a massive housing boom. Read more on that story in today's Big Take. That's at Bloomberg.com or by typing NI Big Take into your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. I'm looking at the drop that we've seen so far in the S&P 500. Even with yesterday's jump, we're still off about 20 percent. And strategists from SockGen think that we could fall to 3,200 or even 3,000, even um, given a strong enough recession. Michael Wilson um, also agrees that we could see a drop to about 3,000 uh, if we have the right kind of recession over at uh, Morgan Stanley. Now, this isn't nearly the kind of drop that we've seen in the last couple of recessions. So we could have a lot further to go. Joining us now is Ksenia Galuchko, Bloomberg Equities team leader. Ksenia, um, what is the consensus now in terms of a U.S. recession? We just heard from Danny about a global recession. Yeah, I mean, fears are out there. We can obviously see that from the stock market action. So we saw a really nice recovery yesterday in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. But today already U.S. futures are pointing lower and at least half of those gains are signaled to be erased. The recession fears are rising. And just like you said, Societe Generale, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, some of these top strategists on Wall Street say that we're far from the bottom in the U.S. stock market sell-off and could see another 15 to 30 percent downside precisely on the fact that the stock market has yet to fully price in the recession fears. Mm, Kazenia, good morning. Uh, we are coming up to that anniversary, the Brexit vote anniversary, uh, fairly soon. Uh, it'll soon be six years since that vote took place. The Resolution Foundation out with an interesting report around the aftermath uh, and the effects we now see on productivity, the labour market and a lot of people's minds. What do we see in terms of stocks and the aftermath of Brexit in UK stocks? Well, the aftermath uh, has been terrible, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, the UK stock market is one of the worst performing major stock indexes globally if you compare in dollar terms over the past six years. So Brexit has um, helped, it has said, as uh, uh, boosted volatility, obviously. It has uh, brought uncertainty. So stocks investors certainly have seen that. However, this year we've been seeing the tide starting to turn because the UK stock market, especially the FTSE 100, is heavily exposed to exporters, oil and commodities companies, and also banks, which have been benefiting, like HSBC, from higher rates. So the outlook has been improving greatly, and the UK stock market is actually one of the better outperformers among developed stock markets this mm. year. So we're seeing only 3% downside compared to over 20 percent for global stocks and U.S. stocks in Europe. Yeah. Well, Ksenia, you mentioned higher rates, and yet what we've seen over the last couple of days is its yields moving lower because of growth concerns. Are lower yields a good thing for equities if what they emanate from is concerns around the global growth picture? Yeah, that's the problem, right? So theoretically speaking, lower yields are good for equities, but because there are concerns about recession, and that is dominating the mood among investors right now, that is actually not such great news for stocks, right? So for all risk assets, you know, the fear of a recession, of a slowdown, of a dramatic drop in uh, uh, earnings because of the inflation risks, that is really dominating the mood and is outweighing the drop in yields, which usually would be good news for stocks. Kazenia, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Kazenia Galuchko with the latest on these markets. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog, MLIV Go. That is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin is calling on the central bank to raise interest rates as fast as it can, as long as it doesn't do undue harm to the markets or the economy. In Barkin's words, go as fast as you can without breaking anything. Fed policymakers raised their benchmark rate by 75 basis points earlier this month, the biggest hike since 1994. Senate Democrats have scrapped a $4,500 bonus tax credit for electric vehicles made with domestic union labor. The measure was opposed by Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, as well as non-unionized EV maker Tesla. It was to be included in the Build Back Better spending bill. China is vowing more pro-growth policies to boost the country's COVID-battered economy. The government will speed up fiscal spending as well as the sale of special local government bonds. Plus, a newspaper affiliated with the cabinet is urging banks to increase lending for infrastructure projects. And Bitcoin is resuming its fall. The largest cryptocurrency is trading just above the $20,000 level. For months, cryptocurrencies have been moving in the same direction as stocks, and today's moves are no exception. Investor appetite for risk assets has been falling in the midst of fears about a recession. But Matt, as we know well, it isn't just about the broader macroeconomic environment turning against risk assets like cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. There has also been the collapse of individual projects that has caused a lot of concern in the market, and it's starting to become a liquidity issue. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot more activity, uh, downward activity, downward pressure due to leverage in mm -hmm. cryptos that's um, helping it become unraveled at a quicker pace. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, I mean, leverage around the economy certainly a concern. I saw with interest another stable coin being launched today, this time pegged to the, to the British pound. I wonder if that can be any more tethered to the pound uh, than, than certain other cryptos have been tethered to the dollar. Uh, something to, to uh, consider and discuss in future. Patrick Spencer joins us next, Managing Director at Robert W. Baird & Co. What does he make of the selling in stocks today, but also more broadly, the, uh, the pivot we've seen to reflecting recession concerns in commodities? That seems to be a big new trend. We'll talk about that. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Fear of a recession is shaking markets again today. U.S. futures and European equities are down. So are oil and other commodities. President Biden tries to ease the pain at the pump. Bloomberg's learned he'll ask Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday. And optimism is evaporating that there can be a soft landing. Investors are waiting to hear Fed Chair Jerome Powell's Senate testimony on fighting inflation. Meanwhile, Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin says the central bank should raise rates as fast as it can. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, uh, something seems to be changing in terms of the way that commodities deal with uh, the headwinds that face the global economy. We've been talking about the possibility for a, a recession for a long time. Maybe those calls getting louder, somehow it's, it's sticking to commodities a little more these days. Yeah, that's right. And maybe helping to defeat the inflation uh, or to work against, at least in some ways, the inflation that the central banks uh, are fighting. Um, take a look at what we're seeing in futures right now down one and a half percent okay we had a big rally yesterday um, but today it seems that the consensus on um, it's not whether we have an inflation but how bad that inflation will be is growing so investors seem to be hiding out in 10-year uh, treasuries right now that pushes the yield down a little bit still at 322 here's the um, drop in commodities as represented by Texas Intermediate crude on the NYMEX down to 104.42 so taking out 5% again today, we had a big drop uh, as well on uh, Friday. NYMEX crude and, and Brent, of course, continue to come down. Bitcoin, um, is it a commodity? Is it a currency? It doesn't really matter. The fact is it trades uh, very well correlated with other risk assets. And as a result, when you see futures down, you see Bitcoin coming down as well. Right now trading at $20,265. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, as you say, Bitcoin, moves with other risk assets like equities. We also have crypto-related equities that move with Bitcoin. Probably no surprise. So as a result, with the reversal of yesterday's moves higher, lower today, you are seeing crypto-related equities under pressure in pre-market trading. The likes of MicroStrategy, the Bitcoin proxy stock, Microsoft.
Michael Saylor. Uh, still a Bitcoin evangelist, even for all the price declines we have seen. Still has that on his balance sheet. It's down about 4.6% before the bell. Uh, Marathon Digital Riot Blockchain also lower. Riot down by about 4.5%. And then Matt was talking about the declines we're seeing across the commodities complex, oil specifically, and that is weighing on energy stocks this morning. Occidental Petroleum is down about 3.8%, and you have Exxon, the oil major, down about 3.5%, Anna. Yeah, the rethink on commodities, the rethink on oil prices, the weakness there, uh, Kaylee, certainly something we're featuring here on European stocks. European equity markets then down by 1.6% today. Basic resources, energy names, they are the stocks that are losing the most ground today. And a lot has to do with that weakness in Brent crude, down by 4.2%. So Matt was talking there about the WTI. Here we've got Brent with a 109 handle. Uh, we've heard for days concern around recession and recession fears in the United States. Uh, ever since we saw the 75 basis points hike from the Fed, of course, that's been a real topic of conversation, but something seems to be sticking to oil prices, as we've said a few times on the program. Now, the UK two-year yield in here, we're seeing money because of risk aversion in other assets, money going into fixed income, so money going into uh, gilts, you might expect. We've also seen a 40-year high, another one on UK inflation, but it wasn't higher than the market had been expecting, and so as a result, perhaps, some in the market unwinding the heavy bets that they had put in on the number of hikes we get from the Bank of England, and so that perhaps also weighing on yields a little bit at the margin. Now, West Group, an interesting throwback to the post-financial crisis days, Kaylee. Uh, this stock down by 3.3% as the government, which is still the major shareholder in NatWest, which was, uh, of course, renamed from RBS uh, all those years ago. Uh, they have said that they'll give themselves another year to sell down their stake in NatWest, and so as a result, the stock goes a little higher today, Kaylee. All right, Anna. Well, as we've been discussing for this entire program, fears of an economic downturn are weighing on risk assets this morning, and guests from the second annual Qatar Economic Forum in Doha have weighed in with their predictions. A recession is inevitable at some point. It's almost unavoidable. I got to think that the odds are that there's going to be a recession. Seeing a cooling of the economy is something that, that uh, we believe is appropriate. As to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. We're going to have kind of a tough period here. Our economists, as you've noted, this morning have increased their odds of a recession this year, but really more focused into next year. If we can stabilize the energy market, I, I believe in the Fed does their job, we'll have inflation under control. Inflation's not going to cure itself. There will be, again, more surprises and more shocks coming from uh, central banks. I think this inflation is quite bad. It's, it's intransigent. It's not transitory. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the consequence will be a recession. Let's add one more voice to this conversation. Joining us now is Patrick Spencer, Managing Director at Robert W. Baird & Co. Okay, Patrick, what's your recession call and how does that translate into your equity call? Okay, a lot of uh, recessions mentioned there in that clip. Um, I think you had Yardini on your uh, on your program yesterday saying this is the uh, the most uh, overhyped recession uh, uh, in, in the history of reporting on recessions. Everybody's expecting it. Does that mean that we're discounting it? Um, but look, or does that mean that the market's discounting it? Uh, we at Baird think there's the likelihood of a 40% uh, recession this year. Um, failing that, um, you know, if, if we do get a recession, uh, you know, our, our estimate is a soft landing, but if we do get a recession, if you look where the market's traded in the past, I think the average decline in a mild recession has been something like 25%. What are you down in the market at, at the moment today on the S&P year to date uh, in the States? You're down 20, 21%. So you're in a bottoming phase here. Maybe you've got 4 or 5% downside from here. But there's been huge destruction, huge damage. And I say, has the market already discounted it? You know, you're down 50% in some of the NASDAQ names. The average stock's down 31%. Okay. Okay, uh, so yes, so Patrick, so we've seen a lot of selling already, of course. Do we need to see more selling in commodities and commodity-related stocks before we fully price in any kind of recession? Well, look, as Matt alluded to, the weakening in economy, look, the market's being helped out by, um, you know, the market that actually, uh, you know, the Fed doesn't need to, I'm sure it will raise rates, but the market's doing its job for it, for us already. You know, we're, the market's, uh, you know, looking at three and a quarter to 375 by, you know, the beginning of uh, next year. So that in itself, you saw the housing starts yesterday. You know, the economy is beginning to roll over. It's slowing, but it's, it, it's you know, still growing. And I think that's really important. Look, my daughter said to me at the weekend, Dad, I can't go to work, my holiday, my holiday job anymore because the cost of 
you know, the cost of the petrol is too much. You look, know, there's demand destruction mm -hmm. happening. So that's going to, you know, that's going to actually help the Fed. And even Dr. Dr. Copper, which is basically known as the, uh, the best indicator uh, for economic growth in the U.S., has been declining. It's come off from 10.5 to below 9,000. So the commodities are telling you that they're going to have some weakening. The market's going to tell you we're going to have some weakening in the earnings. But it's slowing but still growing. And a mild risk, you know, certainly a soft landing is what we expect. I suspect so, in the okay. second half of the... I, I expect in the second half of the year commodities might underperform growth stocks as a result of what we're talking about. Mm. Okay, so you expect just a shallow recession. So we'll, if we get one, you think it will be shallow, Patrick? I mean, there are recessions and there are recessions, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's depressions, there's recessions. Um, this is, you know, all the data at the moment, Anna, is, is okay. I mean, housing starts were down a little yesterday. Um, you know, the majority of economic indicators, you know, the PM, you know, certainly the PMIs um, are, are still growing. They're still above 50. So, you know, I certainly don't see a dramatic downturn here. And the market's already discounted um, higher rates. So, uh, and, uh, you know, certainly the market being down 20% on the S&P, it's already telling you that earnings in the second quarter have got to come under a little bit of pressure. And already, you know, analysts are beginning to adjust their earnings for next year. I think they were 10%. They're now look at 9%. So, yes, earnings are going to get hit. Economy is going to get hit. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily mean the stock market can't, 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 can't do well, given that it's already had a huge correction. Patrick, with that kind of demand destruction, and of course, it's not just your daughter. Um, we hear it from a lot of people who find other ways to travel. Do you still like the energy sector? Yeah, we do, but, you know, less, you know, certainly less so in the second half. I mean, that's going to be the area of growth for this quarter in the second quarter. The most of the growth in second quarter earnings per share in the S&P in the U.S., I think 50 percent of that's going to come from energy earnings uh, this, this quarter. Yes, so for the moment, we like inflation hedges because it's a good place to hide, you know, agricultural shares, oil shares, materials, commodities. But at some stage, you know, to my point about slowing economy, and at some stage, people are going to look over the other side of the valley to 2023, when the Fed will most probably have to start lowering interest rates. Yes. And when you get to that point, you've got to start looking at uh, risk on and well, long duration assets. Well, well um, as, as people look, look towards uh, 2023, we'll see China hopefully uh, also um, loosening up the lockdowns. They'll start driving more. Um, that could drive up demand for, for energy and power global growth. What do you think about the China effect? Well, absolutely. I mean, this, this inflation problem is supply driven. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting. I was at the BED, um, you know, tech and services conference in New York two weeks ago. I went to Macy's to go and buy some clothes. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty common build, so I was looking at all the clothes in my sizes. You can't get them. There's just no supply uh, in, in these stores. But you try and book a restaurant in New York, it's impossible. So, you know, the, the demand is there. So I suspect with China, and of course you've got in China, you've got that important ceremony coming up in October. So Z will make sure that, you know, COVID is behind us by then. The supply lines, you know, should be flowing a little bit better. The inflationary problems uh, should be better. And that should take ease off uh, interest rates. And therefore, to my point about long duration growth stocks doing better in the second half. All growth stocks, though, Patrick? I mean, which ones in particular, if you could get a little bit more specific? Yes, certainly. That's a, that's a great question, um, uh, Kelly. Um, I would have thought big tech, um, uh, you know, big tech growth stocks, which have been under which have been under pressure you know there's been a lot of tech stocks uh, on nasdaq that are down 50 percent but we particularly like the big cap tech stocks uh, that uh, you know certainly on valuations now you can get free cash flow you know almost double free cash flow yields um you know certainly low uh, double digit uh, uh pe's and also some of the discretionary stocks that have been absolutely killed in this market because the consumer, after two years of lockdown, is still in reasonable shape. And consumer consumer confidence is, isn't fantastic, but it's not bad. So, and I think, you know, you've had one or two issues of retailers that have had inventory problems, 
But on the whole, the consumer, to my point about restaurants being full, uh, are, are, are still pretty healthy. So it, big cap tech stocks uh, uh, and also Chinese tech stocks and also consumer discretionary are the areas that we like at the moment. Patrick, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Patrick Spencer of Robert W. Baird & Co. Coming up on the programme, Volkswagen CEO warns gas supplies are at risk. Part of our interview with Herbert Deese. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Slack Technology CEO Stuart Butterfield. That's at 5 p.m. in New York, 10 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I think everyone is concerned, no? Because uh, Europe and the northern part of Germany where we are living uh, is especially prone to uh, uh, Russian gas supplies and it's not so easy to change fast. That was Volkswagen CEO Herbert Diess speaking as part of the Qatar Economic Forum, talking about uh, energy supplies to Germany, what that means for manufacturing, uh, sitting in front of one of those revamped uh, uh, vans, of course. Very nice. Now, oil yeah. is sinking lower this morning as recession risks grip the market. Joining us now is Julian Lee, Bloomberg oil strategist. Julian, good to speak to you. What has changed? I mean, Friday we saw a market that was clearly vulnerable to sell off oil this is and today oil weaker yeah. again what has really changed is this just that the recession fears have become more pronounced have, have, have gotten louder and focus more on the US and that is now weighing on oil I, I think that's a large part of it um, I think that that uh, recession fears are building um, there's a lot of worry around inflation there's a lot of worry around uh, significantly higher interest rates uh, we have the U.S. president who today is going to call on Congress uh, to enact uh, a tax holiday uh, on uh, federal gasoline and diesel taxes. Uh, that's not going to make a huge difference to prices, but I think it is another indicator um, of concern about the economy. Uh, and that is starting to weigh on uh, people's expectations for demand. And it's starting to make people think uh, a lot more about demand destruction, uh, which they see uh, coming through with recession. Julian, how important is China in this equation? I noticed when they started to loosen their lockdowns a few weeks ago, they said they were allowing driving in certain sectors. And of course, there are a lot yeah. of them. Um, does it make a difference if they, if they o open up the lockdowns? Does that make a difference to demand? It, it certainly does make a difference, and we've, we've seen China being at the forefront, I think, of uh, a pickup in air travel over the last uh, couple of weeks as they be some of these lockdowns and uh, not just allowed people to uh, move around within cities, but also to travel between cities, which is a, a, an important part of uh, Chinese demand. Their refineries are uh, running perhaps significantly slower than they would normally do at this time of year, uh, partly as a result of this, uh, the, these lockdowns that they've had in place. They are going to pick up, and that is going to boost uh, Chinese demand for oil. What's much less clear um, is how that's going to affect uh, immediate buying of, of crude by China. There's some suggestion that they may have been building up stockpiles uh, during the, the lockdowns. Um, their, their, their crude buying came off a bit, but, um, you know, we've still seen levels that seem to exceed their consumption quite significantly. And so uh, there may be stockpiles that they're working through. So any pickup may not have an immediate impact on demand. But that's certainly uh, a concern going forward that you've got uh, the United States and Europe going uh, in one direction and, and you've got China coming out of lockdowns, going in the opposite direction. And, and that may uh, underpin uh, a degree of oil demand going into the second half of the year. What, what, what use on the supply side could American producers be, Julian? Mike Wirth of Chevron pointed out that the Biden administration um, is constantly criticizing and at times even vilifying um, the oil industry here. In fact, I remember uh, candidate Biden, when he was campaigning, saying that he thought maybe he, he, he should be jailing some oil executives. 
And now it seems he's, he's not gone to Texas or Oklahoma, but he's going to Saudi Arabia. Why is this administration so, um, so, so angry with the U.S. producers? I, I'm not sure that that is. I, I mean, that's certainly a, a picture that, that some in the industry want to, want to paint, and I, I think that's very much a, uh, a political view. I mean, he has been calling on U.S. producers uh, to pump more. There are huge numbers of, of drilled but uncompleted wells in, uh, in the Permian Basin and other uh, shale basins. There are uh, large uh, acreages of land that are held by oil companies that aren't being drilled. I think the part of the problem is that the, the domestic industry certainly has supply chain problems like everybody else does at the moment. Uh, they are facing significant cost inflation uh, in uh, the, the supplies of, of sand and uh, drilling rigs and, and the, the frack crews. Uh, that makes it much more difficult mm. for them perhaps to expand quickly. I think they're also still being penalized by shareholders uh, for um, following much more uh, expansionist policies that they are okay. uh, much more in a mode of, of giving back to shareholders at the moment. Um, and that, mm. I think, focuses attention elsewhere. Yeah, and, and shareholders' perceptions of ESG and balancing that with energy security, all of that moving very quickly at this point, Julian. Thank you very much, Bloomberg. Yeah. Julian Lee, and of course, we'll keep focused on this because President Biden is going to be meeting with those senior executives from the US oil industry this week. Coming up, uh, Tim Gould, Chief Energy Economist at the International Energy Agency. Uh, a timely conversation there. That's at 7 a.m. in New York, 12 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The planning horizon that we have to attend to would suggest it doesn't get fixed until probably the end of next year. Wow. And the okay. real issue, um, we have a very large, sophisticated, and somewhat fragile supply chain behind the airplane manufacturers. And just as fragile, it turns out, are the operators themselves, the airlines, and the ability to staff up with pilots, the ability to staff up the ground crews, maintenance crews, etc. That is Boeing's CEO, David Calhoun, speaking with us at the Qatar Economic Forum. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us now with his single best chart today. And we're focused in on something that gives the Japanese an edge in global business, right? Tom, you're looking at the yen. Well, it cuts both ways. It gives them an edge, certainly in the export economy. Uh, President Trump would have been screaming about this strong dollar uh, weekend. But there it is, weekend. Let's go right to the chart, and it's real simple. It's a long-term trend chart of trade-weighted yen. And the answer is, down we go. The white circle's where we are now. And you say to yourself, almost a what if, if we go to two standard deviations down, which has happened once, twice, maybe three times uh, across the time here, if we go down that much, what level of yen will we have? And the answer is we'd go to about a 146, which is in the, the, reg the region, Matt, of, of where people are, 140 and beyond. Wow. Wow. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, Tom Keaton, Matt just reeling there. From uh, he's he's been obsessed with the uh, with the weakness in the end. So you're you're talking his language there, Tom. Tom Keaton, anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Well, he's I, up I, next. I, Matt, I, will, I will say, Anna, that I'm I'm watching this very closely because I think that yes. the Bank of Japan is one of the most interesting central banks we have to focus on. A lot of people are talking about going short JGBs or indeed the yen as a way to fund carry trades. Take a look at um, how big the Bank of Japan balance sheet is. Right? I mean, they in in order to fight this, have had to yeah. spend 14 trillion yen. They own almost half of the entire JGB market, which is a pretty yes. shocking uh, way, place to and be. And a lot of focus on how long the BOJ sticks with this current plan. No sign of it wavering just yet, but we know that some in the market have a different view. We'll see if that cracks. I'm watching what's going on with gas markets here in Europe. Once again, Matt, we've seen the German government changing their level of alertness on this from early warning to a state of alarm, which changes the way they prepare for tougher times ahead. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 